evidence gathered suggests that the killing of Mr. Khashoggi was overseen, planned and endorsed by high-level officials warranting further investigation of the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia and of his key advisor, Saud al Qatani. It is such an honor to be back at the Oslo Freedom Forum and a special honor to be here with you, Agnes Kalamar. Thank you. Very pleased to be having this conversation. We are going to focus on Ukraine and on the world's response and the fact that there is not one global response and what that means. But Agnes, before we go in, I want us to start with context. Mm -hmm. What to you does it mean how seismic, how systems changing could it be that Russia decided to invade Ukraine again? Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for um, the, the honor to be, uh, to be here. Thank you to the organizers. Uh, the aggression against Ukraine, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is, um, is more although it's already something very important, is more than an aggression against a sovereign country. There is absolutely no doubt that Russia is seeking to unleash a new world order, or certainly to dismantle uh, the current system. It is uh, seeking to get rid of the rules, the few rules that remain that governed our system, and to put in place something based on power, and military power especially. He is also clearly uh, intending to put a final blow to uh, liberal values. Something he already announced, actually, in the 2019 G20 meeting, where in a very well-known interview he said, liberal Western values are obsolete. The people do not want them anymore. I guess he, he took it upon himself to be the people. And that's what he's trying to do right now. As we all know then, this didn't come out of nowhere. But what about the West, if we, if we use that shorthand? Is there complicity there? It's not a justification, but it is a contextualization. So what I'm going to say next is not seeking to justify what Russia is doing, but it is to put it into a context, and the context is 20 years of dismantlement of the international system, 20 years of dismantlement of the rule-based system, of the UN Charter, 20 years of little encroachment, which at the end become a big encroachment, on dignity, human rights, and so on. That has been led by a number of states, but Western states have played a key role in that through the so-called war on terror, which has been characterized, among other things, by the US invasion of Iraq, which was, as well, a form of aggression. It has been characterized by targeted killings throughout the world. It has been characterized by the blurring of the uh, relationship between war and peace by a global uh, approach to international uh, armed conflict. And that is a context within which we are now seeing Russia's aggression. It is not an accident. It is not an incident. Yes, it is certainly linked to the regime of impunity, that has characterized the action of Russia in the past, and it is a reflection of a system that has been governed to fail. It has been governed to fail. I want to come back to the precedence this is setting yeah. and what you have seen in Ukraine in the last few days. But 
to go further with our theme, the signs were there, the encouraging signs were there for Vladimir Putin. Uh, the lack of accountability for tyrants. This is the running theme of the Oslo Freedom Forum, isn't it? The lack of accountability for tyrants, whether it's Russia's Putin, Syria's Assad. And this has also been at the core of your work, Anya. So I'm thinking in particular yep. of your investigation of the Saudi state murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Mm, the lack of accountability. Absolutely. Um, Jamal Khashoggi is a, is a case in point. Uh, the, uh, the person who ordered his killing, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, has, you know, has not been unaffected by the investigation and by the work done by human rights defenders and journalists around the world. But to this day, he's still not facing um, a court of justice and he has not uh, been held accountable for his murder or the detentions and the forced disappearance of many people. Um, you know, you're talking about Jamal Khashoggi. The only, the other investigation I also conducted was into the attempted murder of Alexei Navalny, and that too is uh, a clear. Um, you know, it's it's the way those uh, leaders think and feel that they can act with total impunity. Imagine. Um, that the Russian government will dare to target Alexei Navalny in that fashion, as they have done with other uh, dissidents, and do so with a sense of supreme power, in the same way that MBS dared to send a team of uh, 15 killers to a sovereign country, Turkey, to kill uh, another dissident. That is what struck me with those um, individuals is they really have a sense of they, can be, they cannot be touched. They have a supreme power over everything. Okay, we saw that sense in Putin's de decision to go into Ukraine yeah. in the scale, the epic scale of the human rights abuses it's committed amazing. by uh, Putin's regime, by the Russian army. You've just been in Ukraine, on yeah. the ground. We've already heard some searing testimony about what is happening within the country. But I'd like your thoughts on, on the scale and the systematic nature of it. Absolutely. I, you know, I cannot add much more to what Alexandra said in terms of um, the lived experience of the Ukrainian people. Um, I just want to talk about Ludmila. Uh, because I spent quite a bit of time with her, and Ludmila is, uh, is a woman probably of my age, and she was so shrunk by, by grief, she was so shrunk by pain and suffering, and yet she spoke. And she spoke about her, her son, her only son, his wife and their children being blown into pieces. They had found refuge in their basement of their apartment building, and that's actually what was targeted. Um, and they all died. She got a few bones left from her son, and she was still looking for a few pieces of remains for uh, um, uh, um, his wife and, and, and the child. So, the voice of Ludmila is what carried uh, me forward during, um, during that mission, but there are thousands of others. What can, we be, what can be said about um, that you have not already read? Um, but let me repeat it. At Amnesty International, we have documented war crimes after war crimes after war crimes in different areas of the country. There is repetition. There is pattern. These are not accident, something that can happen, you know, maybe someone shooting by accident. That is not the case. We have a deliberate practice and policy of, um, of war crimes. So that's the first thing to be said. The second is the scale. When I was there uh, 10 days ago, the, um, the authorities had uh, collected 9,632 cases, allegations of possible war crimes. 9,600. This was 10 days ago. 
It did not include what's happening in Mariupol. It does not include what's happening in all the occupied territories. And as we know, they are discovering more war crimes, even in territories that have been liberated. This is coming on top of 30, more than 30,000 incidents related to the war, such as destruction of, um, of buildings, people losing all of their properties. The scale is enormous. Um, the number of victims is, is extremely vast. The scale of this yeah. and the brutality of it the brutality. seems the unanswerable to all yeah. of us sitting here and watching what, what is being said uh, here in Oslo. Russia's allies are few, and yet, look at the resolution at the UN. There are many countries who choose to be neutral to, to stand back, to abstain, to be non-aligned. Yeah, that's what that's do exactly you say to those yeah. who choose, at the least, not to take sides? So uh, one of the objectives for our mission to um, to Ukraine ten days ago was to tackle what you're talking about. The fact that, yes, maybe in Europe, we think everyone stands by Ukraine. That is not the case. In many countries around the world, um, governments, maybe not the people, but governments have taken a neutral, so-called neutral stand. Uh, I was in South Africa three weeks ago, and there they were talking about reinvigorating, reinventing the non-aligned movement on the back of Ukraine. So there is a real push in many countries around the world for a neutrality on Ukraine. And so we went to Ukraine with, uh, I had colleagues from Africa, I had colleagues from Asia, I had colleagues from Syria, uh, colleagues from Belarus, and of course colleagues from, uh, from Ukraine, because we wanted to show and demonstrate that neutrality is not an option. Yes, there is double standard by the Western world. There is no doubt about it, and we need to tackle that for very forcefully. But the double standard of the Western world does not mean that we can remain neutral in front of the pain and the suffering and the killings and the wanton destruction of that sovereign country. The wanton destruction of the sovereign country. We cannot remain neutral. We must tackle double standard, but we cannot remain neutral. What if, though? What if standing up seems or feels like standing up behind America, behind Western leadership. And what do you say to perhaps even activists in this room who might think, why should we engage when you didn't engage with our plight? Yeah. We need to engage because of what I've said earlier. This is an historical moment. This is the beginning of the end or the beginning of the beginning. What kind of world do we want to live in? What kind of system do we want to create? When people take a stand, which is a neutral stand, they are not sitting at the table. When African countries are saying, oh, we're not going to stand for Ukraine because you know, of Russia and Soviet Union helped us in the fight against colonialism. When they do that, they are not sitting at the table. They are letting, yet again, the United States and Europe Run the show, and that will not be the way to go forward. We need to re establish the basis for a global world system that takes everyone, everyone with them. What does it mean practically, in my opinion? It means first and foremost that the Ukrainian government must understand that the way forward is not just about Europe and the West, it must be about the rest of the world. The effort that they have put into reaching out to European Parliament, to Western Parliament, they must do the same. They must reach out to uh, the African Union, they must reach out to the, um, to the South African Parliament, to the Indian Parliament. They must broaden the coalition to support Ukraine. That's the first thing. The Western world could do the same. It's really very interesting to me that in, you know, when the US started um, seeking to unleash support, uh, for Ukraine. Where did they go after Europe? They went to Saudi Arabia. They went, they went to Morocco. They went to the UAE. They went to Israel. They did not go to Africa. 
so far. They haven't gone to uh, Latin America to try to bring stronger support around them. So that, to me, is, you know, is very problematic. It's also about looking forward, isn't it? It's about yeah. saying this unthinkable action sets precedence. And exactly. we could spend a whole session, we could spend a whole day talking about China, but just in terms of, of precedence set, this is truly a global disaster. It is a global disaster which demands a global answer. It demands a global justice approach. Um, we are talking about setting the ground for a new vision for the way we want to live in. It means justice must be seen as being impartial. It must not only be seen, it must be impartial. It cannot just be the justice driven by a few governments and a few states. We need to build the basis for a global judicial response to uh, Russia aggression. There is a talk of setting up an international tribunal to try Russian um, for the crime of aggression. It cannot just be established by a few Western states. That tribunal must be endorsed by the UN General Assembly. Yes, it may take a bit more time to get a global support for that response, but that will be a response that can carry forward the world, that can carry forward everyone, not just some of the few um, governments that are currently setting the agenda. Neutrality is not possible. It means that everyone must be at the table right now to build that judicial, that justice response to Russia's aggression. And being at the table is an opportunity. It in, is an in opportunity. A time of horror, it is an opportunity. It, it and I would like you to, to finish, Agnes, with a, a thought for those who are here with us, those who are already engaged, who are watching who, who want to be effective, what is needed most as we look forward? Reach out. Reach out to people around the world. Reach out to people who are not convinced that uh, what uh, Russia is doing is um, an attack on every one of us. It is an attack on Ukrainian people, but ultimately it is about dismantling a rule-based system, creating one based on, on power. And as an African colleague has said, it's a form of imperialism that cannot be accepted and tolerated. We need to stand up. Neutrality is not an option. We need to build a global response to Russia's aggression. We need to build a global justice to Russia's aggression. And we need to then look forward to creating the basis for a global system that will take all of us with them, that will treat everyone with dignity and equality. Agnes Kalamar, thank you. Thank you.